church. It's great to have the Spanish-speaking ministry, amen? amen. And uh, for those that are visiting, we, we do have separate services, but uh, whenever we have uh, members come on in, whether by placing membership or restoration or baptism, we always share together because we do believe that we are one body here, amen? amen. Now today's lesson is going to be what prepares our hearts for the communion. And I believe the passages that we're going to be studying, I think are very stirring passages. Some of them are going to be very challenging, and some will be very encouraging. Amen? The title of our lesson today is simply this, The Potter and the Clay. Let's turn to the book of Jeremiah. I was reading over Jeremiah this past week. I said, man, I've got to preach that. That is incredible. Beginning in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. Now, I think most of us understand that the people that work in pottery, they have a wheel that goes around and around as the potter shapes the clay. Yes. Yeah. Verse 4. But when the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands, so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of a potter, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict the disaster that I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I intended to do for it. Our first point is, God is the potter. God tells Nehemiah, uh, Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house, and when you get there, then I am going to give you a message. And God tells him, I am the potter. You need to convey this to my people. They need to understand that just as the potter shapes the clay as it seems best, so I will shape Israel and my people as it seems best to me. The Bible says right here, he says, now, if at some time I pronounce judgment on a kingdom to be uprooted, torn down, or destroyed, but they repent then I will not do anything to them. On the other hand, if I tell another kingdom to be built up and to be planted, and they turn to evil, then I will destroy them. So we need to understand that what God thinks is best is not arbitrary. It is not random. It is not on a whim. It is based on the hearts of men. Turn to Isaiah chapter 55. Verse 8. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Right here is one of those challenging passages. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. The Bible teaches emphatically that God does to us as he thinks best. Not as we think best. His thoughts are different than our thoughts. How different? Well, as the heavens are higher
higher than the earth. So are his ways higher than our ways. Are you with me right here? We need to come to a conviction that though God is sovereign, in other words, everything that happens, either God makes happen or he allows it to happen, it is for our best. We may not think so, but God knows so. Our second point is man is the clay. Let's go back to Jeremiah, but this time to chapter 19. This is what the Lord says. Go and buy a clay jar from the potter. Okay, he's just gone down to the potter's house and seen how it was made, and he got the message. God says, now go back to this same potter and buy a clay jar. Take along some of the elders of the people and the priests and go out to the valley of Beth Hanam, near the gate of the potsherd gate. There proclaim the words I tell you and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I'm going to bring a disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. Verse 10. Then break the jar while those go with you are watching. And say to him, This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. They will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Verse 15. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Listen, I am going to bring on this city and the villages around it every disaster I pronounced against them because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to my words. Have you ever had a stiff neck? You don't want to move at all. You don't want to change. But a lot of people are stiff necked towards God. And in the Old Testament, it was not uncommon for God to give the prophet a challenge to do something visual so that people would not forget the teaching. Of God's word. In this case, he sent Jeremiah down to the potter's house to purchase a jar. And he said, Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the valley of Ben Hinnom. We know this better as, as Gena. This is where the fires burnt. He said, I want you to take the leaders down there. Take the jar with you. And then he says, you tell them that because they have done evil in my sight, because they've been stiff-necked and refused, to do my will, I will smash them. That is what God will do to anybody that gets stiff necked in his ways. What does God want? God wants our hearts to be moldable in His hand. To, to be whatever He thinks best. Not what we think best. But what we think best. And whatever role, place, time, situation, whatever the word of God says, we will conform to the will of God. And not be stiff-necked and obstinate. I'm going to leave that right there. (laughs) You know, yesterday, unfortunately, the Lord provided for me 
a sermon illustration. It's from my own life. I plan to preach this on Friday. And so, you know, I'm always looking for sermon illustrations. And so he gave me this illustration. You know, our workshop was incredible, wasn't it? And we were so blessed to have so many visiting from so far. And Elaine and I tried to get in there and meet with them and talk with them and share. And it it put an extra burden on the schedule. Uh, My brother-in-law, your prayers are being answered. He's doing much better. He was able to walk up the stairs yesterday. And then my mom came into town. And of course, I wanted to pick her on up. And she spent the night. And I was entertaining. But we have all this stuff. And of course, we have a few things like the church finances and things kind of like this. And so I was in the midst of just about finishing up everything. And I've got one more phone call to make. I'm in the car with Elena, And I'm making the phone call. And you know how sometimes when you dial your, your cell phone in the car, you can swerve over just a little oh. bit? Oh. <laughs> and then he goes, Stop that! Stop that! <laughs> what? You're swerving over! I go, Babe, don't do that to me! felt your, your heart get hard? Yeah. Mine was a rock. I found that my heart gets hard at anger, yeah. lust, bitterness, someone opposing my will. sitting there and you're supposed to be a disciple yeah. and you know you're supposed to have a real soft heart yeah. but it's rock hard yeah. and, you, and you just feel it I mean you can, you, you can feel your heart get hard and I sat there for a few minutes and I go you know she really should apologize <laughs> I knew I really need to apologize. And, and, and I apologize. And you know something? It's the most amazing thing when you apologize. Your heart gets soft. I mean, anybody that doesn't believe in the spiritual world is totally out of touch with sin. They're just hard-hearted all the time. See, that's what happens. See, if, if you keep a hold of your anger... And your bitterness and your lust and all these people that are opposing you and you keep a hold of it for a few minutes and they go into a few hours and it becomes a few days, a few weeks, your heart becomes so hard that you don't even know that you've totally left God because you don't care anymore you see the opposite of love is not hate hate you're still feeling stuff the opposite of love is apathy to quote Rhett Butler you just don't give a darn That's what we can get. But we need to understand, number one, God is the potter. Number two, man is the clay. Point number three. But God works in every way. Let's turn to Acts 17. In Acts 17... The Bible says in verse 26, From one man God made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them in the exact places they should live. God did this so that men would seek him, perhaps reach out for him, and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. 
You see, God puts us in exactly the right place and time so that we will what? Seek Him. Reach out for Him. Now, He may have to smash us. And I don't know about you, man. When, when, when Benjamin and Maria shared their life stories, you saw people that were smashed by God because of their sin. And I know that we all were just so fired up to have him back with the Lord and the family. But we need to understand that's what happens. That's what happens. And right here we find that God appoints the exact places and times so that people would come to God. Or in many cases, so that people would come back to God. See, God's not going to quit on you. You might quit on him, but he's not going to quit on you. He's going to keep putting you in the exact place and time. And sometimes smash you so that you'll begin to seek and reach out and find him. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8. You know, as disciples, sometimes we can get very humanistic about evangelism and reaching out to people. And we can just think it's a matter of perspiration. (laughs) In other words, just a matter of hard work. We're working so hard to save souls. Let's read the Bible and see what's really going on. In Acts chapter 8, we read this beginning in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Verse 36. As they traveled on the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to chop the stereo. But both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Well, what was going on right here? Well, God appoints the places and the times. Indeed, God works in every way. He appointed the time and the place that Philip would be there. And he appointed the time and the place that the Ethiopian eunuch would be there. But look at this. It's all about God. We notice in verse 26, an angel of the Lord is working on Philip. He says, you need to go there. Have you ever just wondered, why does God want me to go here? Why does God want me to move there? You don't even know. know, You're you're, kind of like Balaam with the donkey. The donkey says, I can't go any further. Not, not, and Balaam starts whipping the donkey. And finally, of course, the angel appears. And sometimes, you know, we're more Balaam than even a donkey. We're that obstinate. You see, evangelistically, what happens when people are being drawn to God? Well, God has orchestrated the times and the places. He has his angels working. Then the Bible says, in verse 29, The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. He's got his spirit working. Have you ever just, you know, you've been standing line, you go, my God, go share with that person. No, I don't want to. That's the Holy Spirit giving you a little shove. That's right. Then the Bible says he was reading the word of God, Isaiah. It just happened to be about the prophecy of Jesus. So you have the word of God working right here. And then, lastly, you have a disciple. With a soft heart. Someone that's willing to be molded and used the way that God wants them to be used. The spirit would be willing. The angel would be willing. The word of God would be willing. But if there is not a heart, then the Ethiopian eunuchs of the world will not come to Christ. See, we need to have a conviction that God works in every way. It's kind of interesting. You know, I thought we, we had an incredible workshop, and I was very fired up about my lesson. And, you know, as the preacher, you know, you get real fired up about what you're teaching. 
And, and you kind of think that everybody absorbed like 100% of it. <laughs> and it became clear through the week that I, I go, well, we're down to 90, 70, 60, 40. I'm, we need to even go back to a passage. Hey, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Right. We need to revisit this area right here. We need to understand something. Verse 7. Remember, God works in every way. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. The Bible teaches that hardship, all hardship, is a discipline of God. God either makes your hardship directly come to you or He allows it to come to you. Now, what's the purpose of hardship? Well, verse 10. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. Now remember what Jeremiah taught is that God shapes us as He thinks best. Now our earthly fathers, we have a myriad of different experiences in the room. Some of you didn't have very good earthly dads. I was very blessed to have a, a, a good dad. He wasn't perfect, but he disciplined me as he thought best. Now, he messed up a few times because he's a human. But God is absolutely perfect. He is perfect in his discipline. He is perfect in his will. What he thinks is best is perfect. Now, look at this. Verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant time, but painful. Can I have an amen right there? Amen. Now look at this. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of prices and peace for those who've been trained by it. See, discipline, the very nature of it is pain. But there's a purpose. God wants you to become holy. He wants you to become a better Christian. Look at verse 14. Make every effort to live at peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, the problem is a lot of us get stiff-necked. We don't like the discipline of God. We don't like the hardship. And we don't become a more holy person, a better Christian. We become a bitter Christian. Think about it. What produces bitterness? Hardship. Hardship. See, God works in every way. So, but you don't understand. There were people that sinned against me. There was unrighteousness done against me. That's why I'm so bitter. That's why I'm so angry. Well, okay. Well, let's go back to verse 2, chapter 12 right here. Let's look at someone else that had to deal with that. Verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, this is Jesus, think about him, who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. Why do so many people fall away? They grow weary, they lose heart because of their bitterness, but they blame it on sinful men. Hey, no one was unjustly attacked more than Jesus. The whole cross was an injustice. And yet it was the will of God. It brought salvation to the very men that crucified him, you and me. See, God knows what is best. You know, I really feel like one of the things that we need to get a hold of is that God works in every way. I don't know about you, but last week, I mean, it was, it was blow away with Michaela's baptism. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that young lady is a new person in Jesus Christ. Her zeal, I, I know, moves so many of us. But I was equally moved with Gerardo Mendez's baptism. I mean, I don't know if you remember. First of all, you see, his wife gets met. She's American. And she becomes a disciple. But he was resistant. Why? He was bitter. 
and angry. Well, why? Well, you see, they used to live in Mexico. He happens to be Mexican. And when he was in Mexico, he had some surgery. And during the surgery, the doctors messed up and really messed up his kidneys to the point that he has to be on dialysis 10 hours a day. He has a dialysis machine at his home. Well, in order to get the kind of supervision that he needs and the kind of health care that he needs and can be entitled to here in America, they moved from Mexico back here to L.A. Why? For his health care. No. So that Nelly could get met, become a disciple, and that Gerardo would have a chance. You know, when he came to understand that, oh my gosh, the doctor's mistake, sin, was part of the hardship discipline of God that crushed me and humbled me so I would A, move to a place I could be a disciple, and B, be humble enough to receive it. Wow. What is your hardship right now? What is God trying to teach you? See, we need to get a conviction. God works in every way. Number four. Yes, God is the potter. Man is the clay. God works in every way. And God changes us every day. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 13, we are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. You remember that account when Moses went up to Mount Sinai? He went up to Mount Sinai and there he was with God. And whenever Moses was with God, his face would be radiant. Because that's, I mean, that's what happens when you hang around God. I mean, God is awesome. And, 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 and he would be so radiant because he was with the Lord. And then he would come down the mountain to all the people and all the problems. And the radiance would start to fade. And he put a veil over his face because he didn't want anybody to see that it was fading. Well, now look at verse 18. (laughs) And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Guys, this is incredible. He says, as disciples, we have unveiled faces. In other words, we have total access to God all the time. And therefore, we should be transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Well, the word transform right here, literally in the Greek, is metamorphosis. A change. A transformation. Like a caterpillar to a butterfly. Like a tadpole to a frog. Like what you were to more like Jesus. It's not the one time that you visit the mountain and you get baptized. Right. A disciple's life should be characterized by ever increasing glory, by ever increasing radiance. This should be happening on a daily basis. Well, let's look at some very basic daily things. To see if we're really following the path to be able to be radiant and changing to become more and more like the Lord. Amen? Amen. We'll look at some passages here. Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17, verse 11. Now the Bereans were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if Paul said was true. Right here, it talks about having daily Bible study and digging into the Scriptures. Not having a casual reading, but digging in there 
every day. You know, when you're really digging in the Word of God, your life is going to change. You know, folks that uh, Elena and I love with all of our hearts are Nick and Denise Bordieri. Yeah. And let's just say they've been through a tough, tough past few months. They had a lot of hardship. So the Lord was trying to help them out a little bit right here. And uh, it, it was awesome. I, I really appreciate their hearts right around New Year's time. They knew that they were going to take on the challenge of the, the new hope. And so, well, what, what do we need to do to be ready to do something like this? And I, I think Denise was the humble one that asked the question. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, sis, let me just be honest. The, the, the number one thing that's important when you're going to do something like this is you've got to be strong spiritually. And, and, and you and Nick have had a tough few months right here. Well, what do I do? I said, you need to start really getting in the Word of God. Well, what do I do? Well, you need to study things that are relevant. You need to start studying about the poor and the needy and the orphans. See, a lot of people don't get anything out of their Bible study because they're not studying the very things they need to work on. No wonder God isn't speaking to you. You know, it's been, it's, it's been awesome because the second challenge that we have is daily prayer. You know, Jesus said in Luke eleven three. He says, this is the way you should pray. Give us each day our daily bread. Right. Now, if we're supposed to pray for daily bread, how often are we supposed to be praying? Yeah. Every day. And a lot of us eat a lot more than one time in a day, I can tell. <laughs> so we should be praying a lot more than one time during the day. Amen? Yeah. But my favorite passage on daily prayer actually comes from the book of Psalms. Psalm number 5. David says in verse 1, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my sign. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. Woo! That's a quiet time. It's about I cry out to the Lord. And then I just wait in expectation. Is that awesome? See, it's really great because I, I'm really proud of Denise. Not only has she gone after her Bible study, I mean really started to dig in the Word of God. But she also on her own got herself a prayer journal. Not only recording prayers, but to having a prayer list. You know, a lot of us are so faithless because they were not in the Word of God and according to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, is faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is the word of God. Amen. But secondly, we're, we're not praying hard and specifically. When you pray hard and specifically over and over again, and you lay your request before the Lord, the Lord is going to answer those prayers. How about it? I mean, is this your heart? Daily Bible study. Daily prayers where you're just praying specifically and then you're waiting for God to move. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Come on. In Hebrews chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 12, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. Does anybody want to deal with all the sin and unbelief in their hearts? He says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. All right, here, the Bible teaches that in one day's time, our heart can become hard. That's true for anybody. No matter how long you made a disciple, just one day can take you out. A day where you get that hard, hard for a few minutes, to a few hours, to a few days, to a few weeks, and it's so hard, you don't even know that you've turned away from living God. Oh, you may even go to church, but your heart is away from God. Secondly, we find right here in this passage, 
He says, see to it, brothers. You know, a lot of people think that they give a contribution to pay the preacher to do their Christianity for them. That's just not in the Bible. I, I got enough challenges of my own. My own Christianity is enough of a challenge. All, all that your gracious giving, and I, and I want to commend you guys for being so sacrificial with your pledges. But that sacrifice just simply allows me to serve the Lord to help more people come to Christ, more people be restored, and to help and encourage you in your own faith. But I'm not the only one that's supposed to be involved daily in the lives of disciples. The Bible right here says you. In other words, every single brother and sister is responsible to every single brother and sister to make sure they don't get a hard heart. How? By daily encouragement. It's not just the preacher. It's not just the Bible talk leaders. Every single disciple is supposed to be watching out for all the other disciples. And we need to be doing it every day. Yes, if someone misses services, it's, it's of grave concern. Now, maybe they got the flu really bad. Maybe they had a flat tire in the way of church. A- amen. No, those things will happen. But maybe they're just weak in their faith or they've fallen into sin and they just didn't want to come. The loving brother, the loving sister is going to find out what's going on. But that's not the only time. You need to be involved in people's lives every single day. Let's look on here. Go to Acts chapter 20. Paul, in speaking to the elders there that he trained from baptism forward, says in verse 31, Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Do you have someone like that in your life? Someone that cries over you? Someone that cares so much they're willing to warn you in the day, they're willing to warn you at night. They really want to help Everybody needs daily discipling. Yeah, we like the daily encouragement, but right here is the daily discipling. That's the only way you're going to make it. You cannot solo it into heaven. You've got to have disciples in your life. And yes... We need to have a passion for our brothers and sisters. But listen, let me say something. If you run so fast and so far, we can't chase you down. You got to have a soft heart that says, listen, I want people in my life. I want people to know my worst stuff. But because they love the Lord, they're still going to love me. Isn't that the coolest thing, guys? To have people that care about you, even when they know the worst garbage in your life? Yeah. That's a true family. And that's how you keep your soft heart. Look, Acts 5. These are just passages about the early church right here. In Acts 5 and verse 42, it says, Day after day, in the temple courts from house to house, the apostles never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. The apostles were our example. Every day they were sharing their faith. They were just so fired up for God. The text, the context right here is they just were beaten. They just were flogged and they're just fired up to come to their faith every day. How about it, guys? God changes every day, but only when we are within the will of God. Daily Bible study. Daily prayer. Daily encouragement. Daily discipling and daily evangelism. Yeah. You know, this past week we were, we were blessed to, to get with a sister. I'm not going to mention Colleen's name. <laughs> but, but we ate at the kettle. It's kind of a favorite spot. And I said, I said, sis, don't you miss evangelism? See, a lot of people are afraid of evangelism. I think it's the coolest thing. Yeah. I mean, you can be in the hugest of crowds and you alone, you may not know their name, but you have the answer That's right. for their life. Yeah. Is that the most intense thought you've ever had? <laughs> can you imagine someone, because of personal decisions, has said, well, I, I can't share the good news anymore. I've got the truth. I can change your life, but... I I can't because I'm not doing what God wants me to. Yeah, 
think some of us, we look at evangelism as, as this horrific burden instead of this unbelievable opportunity. It's staggering the opportunity that we have to represent our God. See, God changes us every day. I don't think I'll be able to forget too soon Luis Ramos' baptism. When Luis got on up here, and you know, he's an imposing fella, and, and came across strong at first, and then he said, you know something, but my wife says, I'm not emotional. And then he just totally breaks down. I go, wow, man, this is awesome. <laughs> Hope his wife's watching. Because, <laughs> you know, it is something really amazing when you see someone change before your eyes. Yeah. Right. Well, she was watching because Irma's getting baptized today. <laughs> Guys, change not only encourages you but it'll evangelize the world. That's right. yeah. The changing. Not just changing this or change that, but changing to become a more holy and better person. It is the hope of the world. Yeah. Right. And what a blessing we have to be able to share our faith. Yeah. Right. And the blessing overflows not only in our lives, but our family. I was, I was really touched by uh, the, the, the James family, Damon and Vicki James. And uh, I, I love them a lot and appreciate them. They got two of the cutest little girls you've ever seen. Well, the Jameses, you know, they have made some radical repentance since coming back to the Lord. They went through some tough hardships. The Lord had to smash them. Seems to be consistent in the story. But the beautiful thing is what's happening, the overflow of that blessing into the children. The two girls now got so fired up about the New York mission team and DJ and Casey, they love DJ and Casey, <laughs> going to plant a new church there in New York City. They've come on up with a way to save money in order to help the mission team. They call it the God Jar. <laughs> Can you imagine having a God jar at your home? I mean, guys, here are little children now receiving the overflow of the blessing of their mommy and daddy that have come back to God. Here's a young wife who, when I saw Irma, it was vibrant and radiant. Why? Because her husband's changed. What is the hope for your family? Yes, it's Jesus Christ. But it's you changing your life. People see the changes. They may not like it. They may not want to be around you. Because you're so convicting. But daggone, they can't deny it. And they'll turn themselves in eventually. Let me, let me, let me ask you. Has your life changed enough over the last few months to convert anybody? Wow. I mean, how about it? Are you emotional where you no longer, when in the past you weren't? Do you have your children coming up with a God jar? See, we need, we need to understand God is the potter. Man is the clay. God works in every way. God changes us every day. And, point five, God is with us all the way. I think all of us are familiar with Matthew chapter 28, 19 through 20, where Jesus commands the apostles to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that he commanded them. And then he said, and lo, I will be with you always. 
till the end of the age. See, God is with his people when they're out there doing his will, which is making disciples of the nations. Are you with me? Let's go to our closeout passage in 2 Corinthians 4. In verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Hold it. Here we're back to the clay again. What's the treasure? It's our salvation. It's the kingdom. It's everything good of God. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Now they're different shaped. Right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. To show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. You know, jars of clay are a little fragile. Yeah. yeah. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I like that last one in the Phillips translation. It says, knocked down, but not knocked out. You felt that way? Yeah. Ever been knocked down thinking, I'm not? No, you're not. You got a jar of clay. It's fragile. But daggone it, you got the treasure. The treasure of treasures. Let's read on. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. He's saying... The disciple must die every day. Jesus says, deny yourself. Take it across daily. You must die every day in order to give life to the lost. See, this is what it takes to evangelize the world. We have to deny self. You know, yesterday... uh, I don't know if you knew there were a couple football games that were on. (laughs) And I hadn't had a chance really to watch any games this year. And it's Green Bay game, the Patriots game. And I was kind of hoping I'd be able to maybe see it because, you know, I have been working so hard for the Lord. (laughs) And then, you know, it was was of God, of course. Our, 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 Our dinner, discipleship partner time canceled. I go, (laughs) aw. But Lena goes, oh, that's good, because, you know, we won't be able to get with the board areas tomorrow night. We have tea time. Maybe, maybe, maybe they would still have an opening here Saturday night. I go, babe, it's Saturday afternoon. I'm not feeling it. Not feeling it. But why why, why, why don't you just call? My call. And uh, they were open. So we went all the way down there. And praise God, I, I've got to be open. There was a television in the house and everything. I was able to, but, but, but you know something? At the end of the day, what's a football game? I mean, to be with the Bordieres. To break bread together. To be able to talk about our lives and just all the things that have been challenging and going on. That's what's really important. But to do it, and it may sound funny, I had to die. I had to die. In order to give life. What do you have to die to? Often, it's not having to die to sinful things. It's the things that we like so we can free up time to get with people. Because our lives get so busy. For many Christians, their activity replaces their productivity. And very often their activities center in their own likes and dislikes. How about it this week? Who have you died for? To get with? Yeah. Discipleship partners, yeah. non Christians, studies. Right. See, the power of getting with these people 
is that you are giving them life. Look, look, look at this. This is, this is cool. Verse 13. It's written, I believe, therefore I've spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. He's talking about, man, I'm getting so fired up about going to heaven. Now look at this, verse 15. All of this is for your benefit so that the grace that's reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. He says, you're dying, but it's not just you, but all the other disciples are dying so that more people are living. And more and more people come across. I mean, guys, just the past eight days, I mean, it's been amazing. Gerardo got baptized last week. Michaela got baptized last week. Ezekiel got restored. Now, that is a miracle, amen? I mean, the McClintons placed membership. Daniel Horner placed membership. The Millers placed membership. I mean, today, Anel placed membership. We have Benamin and Maria that got restored. And Irma getting baptized. More and more people are coming to Jesus Christ. Why? Because disciples are dying to themselves to give life to others. Well, what should this do to all of us? So that this may cause thanksgiving to overflow the glory of God. Are you thankful today? Are you just thankful to be a disciple? Just thankful to come and worship the Lord? Just thankful to be in a, 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 a cool church of sold out disciples? I mean, this, this is really neat what we've got here, guys. Our, our, our hearts should just be like overflowing. With thankfulness. And what he says, therefore we don't lose heart. Been feeling a little loss of heart? Well, not if you're thankful. See, if you're thankful, you're going, oh man, this is awesome. The kingdom, people coming to Christ, this is amazing. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, therefore, we don't lose heart. We stay soft-hearted within the will of God. Oh, outwardly, we're wasting away. I see that every morning in the mirror. A trick that is good if you stand back a little bit. And as your eyes go, things get a little fuzzy and it looks a little better. But seriously, I mean, you're looking at your wrinkles. Wrinkles. You're looking at your whiskers that used to be all black. You're trying to comb your hair over the appropriate bald spots and you're going, forget it. You know, you're trying to get your shirt so it lies flat. <laughs> Let's just face it, we're, we're wasting away. But, you know, I can say, I can say, even at 53, I'm being renewed day by day. You know, what's hit me over the last few weeks is, is the Lord has put a lot on us. My mom went through a heart attack. She'll be 80 this year. My dad just found blood in his urine. It could be cancer. He'll be 80 this year. My sister's husband of 47, major stroke, killed one-eighth of his brain. And he started going, wow, something in time is going to happen to me. Whether it's something like that or some other thing, we're all going to go. As one guy said, the mortality rate in Los Angeles is still 100%. (laughs) (laughs) We we got to really think this through. How do you want to spend your life? Watching football? Or trying to help someone get up there with you? So you can hang around in heaven. As a matter of fact, in verse 17, he says, "Ah, what are the hardships of this life? Are light and momentary troubles. (laughs) That's that's all the junk you're facing right now. Ah, Light and momentary. When you die, they're all gone. 
They're all gone. They're momentary. They're not going to last. You're not going to have any financial troubles in heaven. You're not going to have any relationship troubles in heaven. Everybody's going to love you up there. Now, if that's all true, and I believe it is, then don't we want to get as many people up there as possible? Aren't you willing to do just about anything to get other people? I mean, there's so many lost people out there. They're just in sin, hurting, getting smashed by God. There are so many religious people out there that are in false doctrine thinking they're right with God. There are so many of our brothers and sisters that have now fallen away out of sin and loss of heart and weariness. There's so much work to do. And yet, the Bible teaches that God will be with us all the way. Remember, God is the potter. Man is the clay. God works in every way. He changes us every day. And he is with us all the way. Thank you and God bless.